Welcome and happy Thursday. Here we are in the Orlando Sentinels studio and we're going to be talking about financial planning today. Um, we're, we have a couple of experts with us and we're going to be uh, taking questions live, trying to help you understand issues in terms of retirement, college saving plans, how to file taxes if you win big at the casino or, or whatever. Um, and uh, we're doing this in preparation for an event on Sunday where uh, for six hours we're going to have experts available. Uh, the Orlando Sentinel sponsors this along with the Central Florida Certified Financial Planners Association. And um, let's just say for a minute uh, to give you some examples. Uh, maybe you graduated from college recently, you've got $8,000 in credit card debt, and you want to buy a house. Uh, how should you go about that? Or maybe you're worried about the election. Who isn't? Um, Will the stock markets crash if Donald Trump is elected? Or maybe they will if Hillary Clinton is elected. Um, should you pull all your money out of the stock market? Um, or maybe you did win some money at a casino recently. Um, do you have to report that on your taxes? Uh, those are the kind of questions we're talking about. So um, I have two experts here with me I'm going to introduce now. Uh, we got Marissa Bradbury from Sigma Investment Counselors, right? Yeah. And uh, also Colby Winslow from Water Oak Advisors. How you doing? Good. How are you doing? Good. Um, so uh, I love that election question. I'd kind of like to start with that because we're all thinking about it. We can't get away from it. Um, do you actually hear a lot from from people about this that they're actually genuinely worried about what the effect on the economy is going to be? It's probably the number one question that I've been getting lately from clients. Really? Wow. Yeah. Um, and my answer to it typically is the the stock market is a forward looking uh, beast and it already is kind of looking at the polls and what's going on in the election and right. forecasting as to who it thinks is going to win and what's going to happen with the market. Okay. So unless those polls drastically change, right. um, I don't think we're going to see a big difference in the stock market right now. If something does change and say you know Donald Trump starts pulling ahead in the polls significantly, um, you may see some things change in the stock market. Okay. Um, different sectors may look different. I don't know that the entire market in general will fall. Nobody really knows that. It has been a pretty unpredictable election year. Right. Yeah. So, but different sectors could perform differently right. depending on who gets elected. That's that's kind of what I would see. Um, but we do still think that there's, uh, you know, some uncertainty in the market, but. The market likes uncertainty, like the, or, or the, I'm sorry, the market likes certainty. Yeah, uncertainty right. provides opportunity. Okay. Okay. What about you, Colby? Yeah, it's it's something that we see a lot too, um, and I mean, you know, to echo Marissa's points, um, you know, nobody knows what the market's going to do. We right. hope that it's a leading indicator that it's going to tell us what's going to occur. Uh, generally, it'll price in things three, six months in advance. So if you don't see a big swing in the polls, we're going to see, um, you know, I, I think we'll continue to see volatility. Um, I mean, after debates, whatever comes out from those things, we'll see volatility. Uh, but ultimately, you know, if somebody's investing for the long term, you may have a short term um, hiccup in the market. But ultimately, if you're looking over the long term, um, those are going to be the more important things for somebody putting together a full financial plan, um, even though you may experience, like I said, hiccups in the short term. Um, and who knows, after the election, depending on who wins, you may get a, a, a quick jump up in the stock market because everything was confirmed through those elections. So. Um, it's anybody's guess, unfortunately. Okay, you can't. You're not fortune tellers. Huh? Correct. <laughs> all right, but but in general, you're not going to be telling people uh, you should pull all your money out of the stock market now, no, right? I would never yeah. tell anybody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think, okay. One of the biggest things is to make sure that you have an appropriate risk allocation. That right. you're not all stock or not all cash, depending upon what you can handle. Um, okay. You know, typically when you put a plan in place, you usually put a plan in place when you're uh, when you're level headed. Right. When you react in times of stress, that's when things start to go awry very quickly. That's good. Good advice. Um, okay. So again, we're live here uh, in the Orlando Sentinel studio. We have some expert financial planners with us, and we're taking questions live on our Facebook feed. Um, we do have a couple of questions rolling in here. Um, Edward Strine, what are your thoughts about a 401k transfer to a self-directed IRA for a real estate purchase? So I'd say this, this comes up a lot, especially here in Central Florida. Um, a lot of uh, investors have real estate. Sure. Um, there are a lot of things to be very careful about when you go to make that type of transaction. Mm -hmm. um, the IRS doesn't like what they call uh, prohibited transactions okay. inside an IRA. So when you put real estate in an IRA, 
You absolutely can do that. Um, you have to follow some very strict rules. One of the most basic rules is you can't then in turn either use the property, uh, improve the property yourself, uh, basically touch the property. Okay. You almost have to defer that to a property management company. So while you can do it, and we've seen clients do that, you just have to be very careful and make sure you follow some rules around that particular piece. All right. Yeah, and you have to be also very careful when it comes time to start taking your withdrawals. Mm -hmm. You have cash available somewhere else or f through the property to actually fund those withdrawals without having to sell the, the real estate itself. Or okay. So there, there's some other snafus that you have to make sure you're... Right, right. So is that, a, a, that's an, again, a common question here in Central Florida, you're saying? I'd say it comes up quite frequently, again, because a, uh, a lot of individuals may own real estate, whether it was citrus back in the day or uh, large, large blocks of land or considering purchasing, um, you know, a vacation home. Living here, obviously, in the tourist capital of the world, uh, you know, people are looking at vacation homes, trying to consider, you know, is that something I should invest? And so it comes up frequently. Um, that's one that, again, you've got to follow the rules to the T. The last thing you want to do is purchase some real estate and all of a sudden make a transaction um, that you don't realize is a prohibited transaction. If you do, your entire retirement account balance may become taxable right away. Okay. Let's talk about um, the casino question uh, for a minute. Um, you know, a lot of people go to Vegas for a vacation or, or they gamble on a cruise, uh, which we have a lot of those going out of Central Florida, obviously. Um, do you get do you get many questions about that? And uh, what how should they how do you go about reporting something like that or claiming it on your refund? So I mean, on your one return? of the questions that we got last year, I believe, on that was whether or not they could take the the income that they earn from gambling or right. and use it as a Roth IRA contribution or a regular IRA contribution. And you can't do you okay. can't do that. that right. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's just a no. For you have any IRA contribution money has to be W two income. So it's got to be earned income from compensation of some sort that, mm -hmm. you, that you earned in a job. Um, so that's always kind of a one of the questions that we get as far as gambling earnings. Sure. Um, other yeah, and the other thing, you know, anytime it's income, the IRS loves to have it report on your tax return. Right. Um, typically, there will be limits that the casino will uh, not report that income. I hate to break it. Uh, unfortunately, you do have to report that income even if the casino does not provide the document for you. Uh, generally, if it's above a certain dollar amount, though, they will provide you um, some form of documentation that says here's how much you earned. Uh, once they file that with you, they also file it, with the, uh, file it with the IRS. So the IRS gets a copy of what you receive. So if you choose not to report it, you're going to get a love letter from the IRS that says, hey, we think <laughs> you, you have some money here that we need to talk about. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, then. Uh, you know, a casino winning is, is one form of a, a windfall, uh, I guess is the term for it, right? Um, here in Orlando, you know, we have this tragic situation, uh, the Pulse shooting, and right now there's money being distributed to victims and their families. And uh, it's a pretty serious issue. I mean, it's a good thing that, that, that we've been able to raise so much money for them. Um, they're getting that money now. Some people, uh, some of those people may not have ever experienced that large of a sum of money at one time before. Um, so tell us uh, a little bit about how, how they should handle that and uh, invest that money or, or what they should do with it. And, um, and then also, um, I believe you guys are actually going to be providing some free advice or, or at least arranging for that. Tell right. us about that. The FPA of Central Florida, which Colby and I both serve on the board from, is mm -hmm. offering uh, to put some of the um, survivors in contact with uh, certified financial planners who are offering pro cool. bono planning for them. So th they'll, they'll help them out, um, you know, figure out what to do with the money. Some of the, the survivors, from what I'm reading, are going to get as much as three hundred and fifty thousand mm -hmm. dollars, which is a lot of money, and they they they're going to need it. A right. lot of them, you know, if they have some sort of um, you know disability or long term handicap, that they're going to need that money or if to help just them. Or employment was interrupted. And Correct. Yeah. So there's a lot of different things that they need to work through um, with that with those funds to make sure that it provides for all of the care that they need. Yeah. And you know, working with a certified financial planner is the best way to go about it to make sure that they're their needs are being met for the long term. Okay. Yeah, and I think one of the biggest things is when you see that, that type of money show up, um, you know, that the, the, the issue can be, okay, I want to go spend it now, right? I want to spend it on something again. Mm -hmm. It was a, a horrible situation that occurred here. Um, but when somebody receives that type of money, sitting down and talking with somebody first to say, okay, what should I do with this money? What do I need to do? Sometimes you don't necessarily need to invest all of it. It may be, hey, let's figure out 
what bills you have or what types of things occurred right. um, that you maybe need to cover first before we talk about investing that money. Investing isn't always the answer. It's a question of making sure that you're doing the, the most prudent thing with that money. Yeah, um, that's a good point. To do it from that side. So. And then, uh, so again, we're here at the Orlando Sentinel studio talking live about uh, financial planning questions. And this can include a lot of different things, saving for, for college, um, IRA funds, uh, retirement funds, um, windfalls, how to report things on your taxes. And um, you were, we were just, uh, we're taking questions live from you on Facebook. So uh, let us know if you have some. Uh, we got another question here. Um, Well, anyway, I wanted to get back to you about, um, you mentioned certified financial planners. Yes. So uh, you guys are both certified. There's sort of a, a way to do that, yeah. uh, a, a mechanism for getting certified. And it, it, tell us why that's important, why if you're looking for advice, you should, you should look for a certified planner. So I, I think there's a couple things that, that stick out when you're a certified financial planner. Um, there's several requirements um, in order to be a certified financial planner. Uh, you have to sit through uh, some coursework, um, take about 230 hours worth of education. Um, you do have to have a bachelor's degree, uh, and then you have to sit and pass an exam. Uh, the exam is fairly comprehensive, uh, covers everything from you know, general principles of what financial planning is, to insurance, to estate, to tax. Um, so there's a minimum level of competency that's required um, once you become a certified financial planner. Okay. So. It also, the CFP designation also is very broad. Some of the other designations that are out there may be a little more narrow specifically focusing on retirement or on um, you know, college savings, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. The CFP is a, is a very comprehensive, broad designation that, um, that covers a lot of different aspects of your financial life. So. Okay. Um, so the, uh, okay, so we started with an example about somebody who just graduated from college, someone younger, you know, we're thinking about uh, retirement, savings and things like that, but Obviously, people at all stages of life have uh, questions that they need to know about saving for buying a house, for example. Let's say they have some debt, they just got out of college, but they want to buy a house. Um, what kind of advice uh, do you give them? Typically, um, when, when someone's looking to buy a house, uh, you want to have a certain amount of money to put down on the house first off. You don't want to just finance the whole thing. So okay, when right. I work with young people, I typically talk to them about you know helping or figuring out a way to start paying down your debt mm -hmm. and also saving at the same time for a house purchase if sure. that's your ultimate goal. Um, and making sure that you have enough money to put down in the house that you can also afford and not go out of your means. So working with a planner to talk about, okay, let's let's buy a house that's within your right budget, right. Um, in the area that you want to be in. Or maybe let's rent for a little while right. until we save until the money. Until we figure yeah. out where to go, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Specific, yeah, it, or you know, take on roommates, or <laughs> right, right. figure out a right budget for it for that first. Um, it's, it's always exciting to like get, you know, graduate from college and want to start your life right away right. And doing that, but try to figure things out a little bit first before sure. you before you kind of jump into that. Okay. And I think one of the things is, you know, you have to be your own uh, prudent investor in that, in that situation. So when you look to buy a house, there's a lot of people that are typically involved in the transaction. Um, generally, there are commissions paid to real estate right. agents, mortgage lenders, whoever it is. And the higher your purchase price or the larger your purchase price, the more that those particular individuals will make. So there's an incentive uh, from that perspective uh, for them to have you purchase uh, you know, as, as expensive a house as maybe the bank will approve you for or something like that. So you do have to have some uh, a prudent decision on your own. That's where, again, sitting with uh, maybe an independent advisor, say, okay, do you think I can afford this? What is your opinion? Um, you know, it never hurts to get, it, get an independent opinion yeah. from that. Side. Just because you get the letter from the bank saying you're approved to buy a house at $300,000 doesn't necessarily mean you should buy a house at $300,000. Right, right. <laughs> you know, Just like <laughs> if you get another credit card offer in the mail, right? right? <laughs> um, so uh, we just had someone uh, on the Facebook page uh, ask us about uh, if there's anything that people should be concerned about with the upcoming election. We, we just talked about that a little bit. Um, we are, uh, again, we're here live in the Orlando Sentinel studio. We're taking questions about financial planning and uh, we're getting prepared to do a bigger event on Sunday where we're gonna have uh, experts for six hours uh, where people can call in here at the Orlando Sentinel uh, and get advice from, free advice from experts on financial planning issues. Um, so retirement, uh, let's talk about retirement a little bit. Um, Obviously, we have some huge retirement communities here. And uh, do you, uh, what portion of your business is retirement? What are the most common questions? 
So I specifically focus on individuals and planning, and so okay. everybody wants to retire at some point. So it's, right. it's almost that's what we do for, <laughs> for every client, basically. Right. Um, but the main thing is, and, and we were talking about this a little bit before, um, clients often think that they need to come to us when they're getting ready to retire or when they retire. Uh, yeah. The real meeting needs to take place way before <laughs> that. You know, you need to start that plan when you're, you know, young, when you're in your 20s and 30s, making sure that you're putting enough away. Oh, you mean I need to start that plan? <laughs> <Is> that, <okay. laughs> of course. You know, getting started at a young age can really help you so that you're not struggling. You know, if I've got a client who comes to me and they're in their 50s and they want, they're telling me they want to retire at right. age 65, and it, it's a little bit harder than a client in their 30s mm -hmm. um, who's who's wanting to have that plan in place. So. Making sure you get started early, um, and then making sure that you're working with a advisor who has your best interests. Right. You know, making sure that they are not um, putting you in a product just because they're getting a large commission for it or yeah. the, the right thing for it. That they're also working for your best interests. And um, I can see that would be a big problem. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. There's in a fact, lot there's of some new regulations about that, right? Yeah, um, there are, mm -hmm. and um, you know, the new regulations the Department of Labor is putting out regarding the fiduciary obligation. What that, that specifically means is that any advisor is supposed to be putting the client's interest first. Yeah. Hopefully everybody's doing that. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. <laughs> I didn't know we needed a, a new rule about that. Yeah. But, um. <laughs> Unfortunately, I guess they, they thought that we did. Um, what it's going to change in our business is really going to be put, putting you know a lot more disclosures out there. Okay, yeah. So advisors are going to be having to put out there exactly what the clients are paying for and mm -hmm. you know what they're getting from and it. And what type of cut or fee they get from it too. Correct, yeah. it's gonna, it's hopefully will make things more transparent. Um, but it's going to it's going to change the way some people do business. Mm -hmm. you know, which Colby, what about you? Yeah, I'd say um, you know we we work with a lot of retirees as well, focusing on individuals. Um, and I'll echo Marissa's point in that um, you know it's not the day before you retire that you need to talk to an advisor. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times we'll sit and talk with you know business executives or business owners, and you know having those conversations well before are important. Um, you know if somebody has stock options they're looking to do something with, it's not about telling us after the fact that you've already done. It's easier sure. to ask forgiveness than right. permission kind of thing. Um, but having those conversations on the front end saying, okay, let's sit down and talk about, you know, do you have stock options? What do these mean? What do they actually do? Um, with business owners, sitting down talking about succession planning, okay, if, yeah. we, want, if we eventually want you to, uh, you know, leave this particular business, let's start putting a, su a succession plan in place. Um, so those are a lot of the questions that we get and hopefully, again, clients are seeing us well before they get to the point of going, uh-oh, I don't know what to do, I want to retire tomorrow, and we have to say, well, let's pump the brakes a little bit and, and, and reevaluate what we've got going on. So, okay. Um, and then I'll echo Marissa's comments again on the uh, on the, the fiduciary issue. Um, there's going to be a lot more disclosure. So if there wasn't enough paperwork when you signed an account <laughs> application, now there's going to be a lot more after it's all signed. Right. Well, so. you know, I I certainly would want to know if I was being advised by somebody and they're telling me to invest in some fund and and it's because they get a fee from that. Uh, you know. So and, and that's the that's the fear, right? That yeah. you sit in front of somebody that's supposed to be this trusted expert, like we're sitting here. And ultimately, somebody ends up saying, well, this is what's best for you, but you don't know what they're getting on the back end. Right, right. Hopefully, this brings to light the fact that says, guess what? Now you have to tell the client uh, what exactly you're going to receive. So that, that's where all of a sudden you start to talk about different business models, whether it's fee only or commission, and, and you start to get into a much bigger debate uh, behind that piece of it as well. We do have a, a question now about um, retirement funds. Um, Dory, uh, her question is, how is the amount of the required draw against an IRA calculated when one turns 70 and a half? So the IRS issues life expectancy tables. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and those tables have numbers in them that are based on your life expectancy at that age. Okay. So the tip, it starts out at 26.2. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then you divide the number, your, all of your IRAs by that number and it comes out there. So it, okay. every year hmm. it changes. Um, depending on what you're at. So I would highly recommend anybody that is at that age and is starting to do that to work with their financial advisor to make sure they're taking the right amount out okay. and that they're they're doing it appropriately. Um, you know, that one thing clients often look at is they'll have multiple IRAs mm -hmm. and they don't know if, if they need to take an amount out of every single IRA or if they, if they take enough out of one to cover the others then that is also suitable for them. Yeah, so, so you're talking about uh, for an IRA, when you reach a certain age, you actually are required to take money out of that. Correct. And does that matter whether you're working or not? So it's, it's a great question. So there's a lot that goes into it. I'll say um, when you turn 70 and a half and you end up in a situation where you do have an IRA, it's about 3.6% is about that first year's distribution. Okay. And then it slowly ratchets up from there. So 
Uh, when you turn 70 and a half, that all of a sudden shows up. Um, if you are working, uh, it, it won't necessarily make a difference on the IRA side. Oh, okay. Um, in the 401k world, though, it's a little bit different. So Marissa indicated that um, in the IRA world, you can take all of your IRAs, figure out what your distribution is, and take it just from one IRA. Uh, in the 401k world, as an example, it's a little different. Mm -hmm. Each 401k has to have a required minimum distribution. So you may have three 401ks that are sitting out there. You have to take an RMD from each individual 401k. Unless it's a Roth. Yeah. A Roth, you never have to take a withdrawal out okay. of. There's no mandatory withdrawal on Roth IRAs. So you pay the taxes on a Roth before it goes in, and then it's allowed to grow tax-free uh, forever. Okay. So um, so to go back to, uh, once again, we're here in the Orlando Sentinel studio, and we're taking questions live on Facebook and Twitter um, for questions about financial planning. Um, any question that our readers or viewers have, uh, we have experts here uh, ready to answer questions, and we're going to have more uh, available on Sunday. Um, I remember a question, I think, from last year was about a father who was actually employing some of his, his uh, kids, his children, uh, and he was wondering about if he should divert some money into a college saving plan for that or how that might work. Do you, I don't know if you remember that question or not, but... Um, what a, yeah. So I, I can say in, in general, we see this with family members that, let's say, own a business, as mm -hmm. an example, and they have children that work for that business. Um, you can pay your children to work in the business. Now, they do have to have a, a bona fide <laughs> job, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, it could be something as simple as picking up the mail, but they do have to have a job, and you can pay them. Um, and at that point, you have some options. Um, if the individual, if the, if the kids have income, uh, you can save in Roth IRAs, as an example. Um, so sometimes people will use a Roth IRA to fund portions of college expenses. Um, so if you have a family business, there's a lot of detail that goes around that um, mm -hmm. in terms of, of funding accounts, things like that. Um, education funding is a, a completely separate uh, d discussion around that. You don't have to have income in your, uh, for the children in order okay. to start saving for education. But um, there's a lot of vehicles that you can use to save for education from that, uh, such as UTMA accounts or 529 accounts, those types of things. So. So uh, we have a question here from Tina. Um, which countries are experiencing growth right now for purposes of investing in foreign stock? Now, I don't know whether you guys uh, have any expertise in that area or not, but. Um, so there, if you're looking for specific countries that are experiencing growth, the, the historically, the emerging markets were growing at a higher rate than some mm -hmm. of the other developed world. Right. Um, what we've seen recently has been the European countries have actually been in quite a recession um, because of what is going on with Greece, right. Italy, Spain, uh, and, and their economies there. And we have seen a pickup back in growth in the emerging countries. So okay. India, uh, China's come back a little bit, um, and even parts of Brazil and Russia and their economies have come back some, some too on the emerging right. side too. So. The European and developed world has been a little bit flat recently. However, the advice is is that when things are underperforming, that's typically the time to be buying them. True. Right? You want to buy, yeah. the, the saying is you want to buy straw hats of the winter. Yeah. So buying things when they're <laughs> out of favor is typically the better time to be getting into them. Sure. So looking at it that way, if you're um, you know, a contrarian investor, you may want to be looking at the countries that are actually not experiencing growth right now, All right? And that and, and looking it's at like investing. Like that in those. after Christmas sale, right? Correct. Yeah, yeah it's <laughs> sometimes that's always the best way to go. So right. Uh, Colby, do you have anything? You yeah, want and, and I think, I mean, that's key because, you know, when you look at all the different investable worlds, um, you can get access to a lot of different countries through different vehicles. Um, and I think one of the biggest things that we come back to with, with a lot of our clients is, you know, sitting, having that conversation about making sure you have a diversified portfolio. Because mm -hmm. international absolutely should be a part of a, of a portfolio. Um, Marissa's point is, 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 is spot on, saying, okay, just because international may be doing well, that actually may be the time that you don't want to purchase as much right. international. So having a nice, well-diversified portfolio with international as a piece is extremely critical, I'd say, to, to portfolio perform, uh, performance and what it looks like in the future. Okay. So uh, here we are again uh, in the Orlando Sentinel studio taking live questions uh, about financial planning. Um, if you're watching and you have a question, uh, let us know, and we'll try and, uh, we'll try and answer it for you. We have experts here. Um, so, um, so okay. So, in in Central Florida, are there any other like niches here in your practices that you guys deal with or, or concentrate on that you could tell us about? Um, one of the things that I focus a lot on is is women in investment management or mm -hmm. investing. Um, 
and uh, one of the things people say is like, how is investing for women any different than investing for men? Yeah. Um, typically, it's uh, women can be a little bit more removed from the process, and hmm. they and one of the things that I always encourage people to do is to become more involved in it. Ah, okay. Um, especially on an education standpoint. So looking for a financial planner who is going to educate you and work with you and bring you into the fold is something that I highly recommend for any husband and wife sure. or widows or divorcees who are looking for an advisor. Make sure you're, you find somebody who's willing to educate, work with you, um, and you know make sure that they're gonna keep you involved. Okay, that's interesting. I'd say uh, our, our clients typically look, um, uh, we, we work with a lot of business owners, uh, a lot of corporate executives, whatever, and that seems to be our, our, a pretty good niche of ours. Um, you know, being based here in, in Central Florida, we've got a couple Fortune 500 companies right here, um, which we typically like to work with, and we stretch outside kind of the bounds of, of Central Florida to some of the other coasts. Um, so that seems to be our niche. Uh, again, business owners and executives is typically okay. where we end up. Okay. Great. All right. Well, we have been uh, rolling for close to half hour now. Um, we're at the Orlando Sentinel studio, and we're answering questions about financial planning and we have experts here um, and I did just want to say again that we have uh, we have an event this Sunday that we're kind of preparing for right now um, six hours on Sunday the Sentinel is going to have financial planning experts certified experts who will be taking calls and uh, you can ask them any financial planning question you want um, they're all members of the Central Florida Financial Planners Association um, that's from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. this Sunday. And uh, the phone number, which we're going to have uh, printed in very, various different places, it's 407-420-5799. And uh, I, think, uh, I think that just about does it. Do you, you have anything else you wanted to uh, mention? Any, any popular, unusual questions? or? I think that's, I mean, I think, yeah. again, you've got it. There's a great resource on Sunday for the six hours. So anybody that has any questions that, that, uh, that come to mind, um, you know, a lot of times we'll see uh, typical trends. Again, we talk about the election, things like that. But anybody that has questions, um, you know, we're, we're, we're here to help. Uh, and that's going to be the biggest thing is you've got a nice block that you can call um, completely free of charge. There's no solicitation. There's no selling of investments. There's no, there's no right. product pitch in the end. So you're truly hopefully getting a, an independent uh, guidance and independent advice from from a certified financial planner. And, All right. and then the questions will appear in the paper too right. throughout the year, the rest of the year there for you. Yeah, so. yeah. It'll be, yeah, it'll be, it's a good resource for us too to find out what's on people's minds. Right. So, um, so Colby and Marissa, thank you very much. Uh,